So we're going to begin now. Let me introduce Wiki again, uh, WMF Human Rights Policy and Advocacy Lead. Uh, we're going to hear about protecting children on Wiki, a child rights solution workshop. Uh, and you're going to have time for questions at the end. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I can see myself on your screen, so um, let me know if you can hear me okay. Just somebody give me a thumbs up. Great, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining this session uh, this afternoon, and um, happy day four of Wikimania. I hope Poland is treating you well. Um, and thank you to the production staff for um, helping this uh, session happen and, and so far happen smoothly. Um, my name is Ricky Gaines. I am the um, Human Rights Policy and Advocacy Lead at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I work on the global advocacy team and I see um, uh, several colleagues there um, who will also be on hand to, to answer questions that you may have. Um, I will go ahead and begin sharing my screen with you for this workshop. Um, so bear with me one second. All right. Uh, this workshop uh, has four uh, main objectives. The first is to understand risks to children on Wiki. The second is to review and prioritize a series of recommendations that uh, I will share with you on the screen. Uh, we will do that in an interactive exercise. Uh, the third is to develop concrete plans of action that can be led by the uh, volunteer community and affiliates uh, to protect children on Wiki. And finally, we will share our action plans as a group and provide uh, one another with feedback. So without further ado, we will um, go ahead and move into the uh, first uh, portion of this workshop, which is to understanding uh, ch uh, risks to children on Wiki. Um, last year, the foundation uh, completed a child rights impact assessment, um, which we were able to publish this year in February. Um, while I'm talking about this child rights impact assessment, I would invite you to um, check it out on Meta. Uh, there's a link to it uh, at the bottom of the slide in yellow. Um, if you'd like to go to Meta, you can just search for child rights impact assessment and it should be the only one that you will find. Um, but if you would prefer to find it on your mobile device, you can use this QR code uh, to, to locate that same report. Um, so why did we commission this child rights impact assessment? Um, well, the um, the board of directors or the the board of trustees rather approved our human rights policy in December 2021, which committed the foundation to upholding um, the human rights of all those that interact with our products or projects. Um, so that would be volunteers like yourself, uh, staff, as well as the general public that that accesses um, our free knowledge projects. Um, this. Um, human rights policy, as well as this child rights impact assessment, were both uh, direct recommendations that we received in our first ever human rights impact assessment that the foundation carried out in 2020, uh, which evaluated the human rights um, opportunities and risks across the entire movement. So it looked at everything the foundation and the volunteer communities do to better understand those risks. And one of the five key risks that was identified in this report were risks to children. Uh, because children have um, unique rights, they have uh, unique vulnerabilities online, and so it was recommended that we carry out a specific child rights impact assessment to better understand um, the impacts um, our projects can have on children. Um, this report also came at a very uh, timely moment for our movement, uh, as well as the kind of political landscape around the world, uh, because there's growing interest among governments to legislate and regulate for child safety online. Um, so what did this report uh, uh, evaluate exactly? Um, it looked at opportunities for children, um, which we defined as um, those um, under the age of 18. Um, so what sort of benefits can children gain from, from access to Wikimedia projects and the ability to participate in them actively? Um, it also uh, evaluated risks facing children on Wikimedia projects. So what kind of bad things can happen to children uh, when they're accessing or actively participating in our projects? And the output of this assessment 
um, or the output of this exercise was a report um, assessing how the movement manages child-related risks and provided us with some actionable recommendations that we can take as a, uh, as a community to better protect children on Wiki. Um, earlier, I said that this, this uh, report came at a very important moment for the movement because um, governments around the world are uh, working to, to legislate and regulate uh, online platforms like Wikipedia to keep children safe. And so this is uh, just a, a quick sort of overview of, of some of the, the big um, uh, child safety regulation that's happening around the world. Uh, my colleague Ziski put this slide together, and it's a fantastic slide, um, noting just some of the, um, the um, bills and laws uh, that the global advocacy team is tracking. So uh, in the UK, we have the Online Safety Act. Um, in the U.S., we have the Kids Online Safety Act and the Children and Teens Online Privacy Protection Act, just to name a few. And so while you may not see your country on this map of uh, child-related regulation, uh, what's important to know is that any one of these can have a really significant impact um, on Wikipedia and, uh, you know, specific language communities. And, you know, beyond that, um, even if your country is not represented on this map of, of laws and regulations, um, your country may see, your government may see something that is happening in Germany or Spain or Brazil and try to adopt that um, into their own legislation. So that, indeed, these pieces of legislation can, can kind of have downstream impacts on, on other countries around the world. So this report or this exercise considered three main groups of children um, and, and analyzed risks according to, to, to these groups. Uh, the first group is uh, child editors, um, so volunteer editors and, and administrators that are actively participating and contributing to our projects. Um, while we don't know kind of how many editors there are, we know anecdotally that there have been, uh, you know, several, um, you know, child editors, many of whom, you know, might be, uh, you know, kind of in this room represented as, as uh, you know, adult Wik Wikimedians that started as child Wikimedians. Uh, but, but we do know that there are plenty of children out there that are um, contributing to, to Wikimedia projects. Um, the second group is uh, categorized as in-person participants. So this would be, um, you know, children who are participating in clubs or events at school that are related to Wikimedia projects, um, attendees of various Wikimedia events, including Wikimania. Uh, you might have seen some, some children among your ranks this week, um, as well as attendees of informal meetups. And the third and final category of uh, children that was considered under this um, uh, under this exercise was the general public. So this would be sort of the passive uh, readers of Wikimedia content. So perhaps children that are, you know, doing research on Wikipedia for school projects. Um, it also considers um, children who may be the subjects of Wikimedia content. So this could be, you know, an article on Wikipedia describing a child celebrity or a child. Um, you know, climate activists, or perhaps even the, you know, minor children of uh, very prominent politicians or, or other world leaders. Um, so, so these are the three kind of categories that, that this report looks at. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the benefits to children are for participating and having access to Wikimedia projects. Um, this is not only about um, you know, protecting children from the bad things, but make, making sure that we are protecting their access to the good things um, about Wikimedia projects. Uh, so sort of, you know, at the center, kind of the nucleus of, of uh, the benefits and opportunities that children stand to gain um, are freedom of expression, uh, which is defined as the right to uh, seek, receive, and impart information and ideas regardless of borders. Uh, which I think is, you know, it, it's a fundamental human right enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but I think it really speaks to sort of the core mission of Wikimedia projects. And that, of course, includes the right to access information and, of course, the ability to participate in our movement um, enables children to exercise their freedom of association, uh, so to participate in groups. Um, as you kind of move out from those core um, you know, nucleus of, of rights that um, our projects help children to realize. Um, they also have secondary and tertiary benefits as well. So kind of moving out, you know, the secondary benefits could be right to education and development. So we all know in this room, 
uh, that children participating in Wikipedia or in other Wikimedia projects are also doing, are all, often doing so to learn. And so we're helping them learn. We're helping with their, uh, you know, mental development as well as sort of their economic development later in life. We're also facilitating their rights to participate in the civic, cultural, social, and political lives, uh, you know, within their community. So they can learn about civic issues. They can learn about their own culture or cultures around them. They can learn about issues impacting the, the society in which they live. And they can also start to, to learn about political issues facing their communities, political leaders, um, you know, all of these aspects to, to living in a society. Wikimedia projects help them um, realize that right to participation. And then the kind of moving out even further, the tertiary benefits of uh, access to Wikimedia projects and the ability to participate in our movement uh, really include lifelong benefits uh, to economic opportunities and self-esteem. So children that are participating actively in our projects as editors, they're learning important skills about, you know, writing and researching and how to cite their sources. Um, they are learning how to operate sort of with, you know, larger teams and how to uh, uh, demonstrate and develop leadership within a community. Um, and it also, you know, being able to, you know, develop and improve upon these skills helps them to feel better about themselves. Um, but it also gives them, you know, a sense of meaning that they are participating in something that serves, you know, a greater good and, you know, sir, you know, working with a project that is bigger than themselves um, to help make the world a better place. So there are just, you know, a number of ways that children benefit um, from Wikimedia projects. Uh, but of course, um, you know, participating in our projects or accessing them is not without risk. Um, and I want to be, um, you know, very kind of candid. Um, these risks are inherent to to many online platforms. So I think it's it's fair to say that a child accessing any sort of online platform or service, um, you know, can confront some sort of risks. So we should not be surprised to see these risks um, in this report. Um, you know, some of these risks you would associate with, you know, with anything online. Um, but, you know, when we talk about risks and the bad things that can happen to children online, we often think about um, social media and the harms that can occur there. We'll see some of these same harms, you know, being discussed in this report. Uh, but because, you know, Wiki, Wikipedia, our biggest project, is an encyclopedia, not a social media site that is, you know, um, you know, forcing ads on people, including children, or collecting and selling their data. The risks are a very different nature and different scope and magnitude. Um, I think just kind of among you in this room, um, I know you are all veteran, experienced Wikimedians. So I don't think that any of these risks are going to be a, a, a big surprise to you, uh, because a lot of these also um, can, you know, a lot of these risks can, can be manifested among adult Wikimedians, too. So particularly, you know, looking at harassment and bullying, um, I think um, it's fair to say that this can happen to to anyone on Wikimedia projects. Uh, but we also have to, to to be realistic and know that harassment and bullying can have a, a much um, stronger impact on the the mental well being of children versus an adult. Um, children also run the risk of exposure to harmful content and misrepresentation of facts. So when we're talking harmful content, you know, this can be things like um, uh, pages about suicide methods or eating disorders. So things that are, you know, maybe a little ugly or difficult to talk about, but not necessarily illegal that we still, uh, you know, find from time to time on Wikimedia projects. And of course, mis misrepresentation of facts. So this is referring to mis and disinformation, uh, which children can have a, um, a more difficult time distinguishing from uh, from reality. Um, children can also um, suffer from the infringement on the right to privacy. Um, sometimes children just don't know kind of what sort of information they should or should not put out online about themselves to protect their own privacy. So sometimes, you know, usernames can, can give a little too much information or their, you know, user pages on Wiki can give a little bit too much information that can allow um, you know, the bad guys out there to, to identify their, their actual identity and, and contact them in other ways. Um, so that gets into the harmful contact and child exploitation, um, which can also include something we call CSAM, which is child sexual abuse material. Um, so that could be, you know, something like child pornography um, appearing, um, you know, occasionally on, on, uh, on projects like uh, Wikimedia Commons. 
Um, of course, children can also, um, um, you know, be harmed by the effects of discrimination and non-equity. Um, perhaps children on Wiki, um, you know, their their opinions are discounted, or their their edits are discounted or reverted, you know, at a higher rate when when someone perceives that they are a child, um, and you know, they just because they are, you know, because they are minors, they are not able to participate in sort of the you know, in-person gatherings where, um, uh, you know, important decisions about the direction of our movement are held, um, which impacts the equitable participation of children in our movement. Um, children can also um, be harmed by the inaccessibility and inequity of, um, of Internet access. Um, so sometimes they do not have um, as regular access to computers or mobile devices as adults have impacting their ability to access and participate in our projects. Um, they can also um, be harmed by a lack of voice in our movement that is primarily uh, run by adults, including, um, you know, the adults at Wikimania, um, the adults in ARBCOM, the adults on the board, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there's very little room for children to participate and ch share their own perspectives and needs, um, you know, with the governing structures within our movement. And then inadequate access to remedy, that's just a fancy way of saying sometimes they don't know how to report when there are problems or ask for help or to seek assistance because our projects can be a little convoluted, a little bit complex to navigate using language that is geared for adults rather than language that is geared towards children. So it makes it harder for them to, to seek uh, help and assistance when they encounter problems. So as I said earlier, we commissioned this report um, in 2022 no, 2023, and we published it in January 2024. And so this begs the question, what have we accomplished since receiving this report? Um, the foundation has published a combating online child exploitation policy. Um, within that policy, we have provided easy to understand recommendations uh, for children to use to protect themselves. So the language is actually very simple to help children understand how, how they can keep themselves online. Um, the foundation has continued the development of the incident reporting system, which will be sort of a more universal, streamlined way for all users, including children, to report, you know, incidents of inappropriate behavior or contact or, or just other things that could make children uncomfortable. Uh, we've begun including child rights consideration um, into recent reviews of grant applications. Uh, we've identified and documented activities and initiatives occurring within our communities and the foundation itself that work to both empower and protect children on Wiki. Uh, we've improved the structure um, within the foundation uh, of our Human Rights Steering Committee to be a little bit more agile and responsive to be able to address some of the findings that were, um, you know, um, identified in this report. And we've also designated a current staff member to lead child safeguarding efforts within the foundation's trust and safety team. So this is um, our colleague, uh, Joe, who, who has the right expertise to be able to, to really um, support children, support communities, and, and protecting children on Wiki, and was also a leader in, in developing the Combating Online Child uh, Exploitation Policy. Um, before we move on to reviewing and prioritizing recommendations, um, I'll open the floor just in case there are any quick questions or clar clarifications that anybody in the room would like to, to make. All right, I, I think we may have one question over to the side. May, yeah, one question because uh, it was not currently not on the report because in Germany we have the discussion if children are allowed to publish photos under full license in, in general if they are general allowed by law. So that was not in the report the the yeah the licensing question if children are allowed to do this. Yeah, you know, th th that is a, a, a great question. Um, and I don't think, I, I think that's a very kind of legalistic question. And I think that our colleagues that work at the foundation's legal affairs department uh, would be able to give a more informed um, opinion on that. Uh, but you're right. 
you know, are children allowed, you know, are, can children post photos of themselves on commons? You know, that's, I, I think maybe in terms of, you know, the, the, there's certainly legal questions to that. There, there are questions around kind of creative commons and, you know, copyright laws, things like that. There are also, you know, legal questions at the national level that change country to country. I think what this report is kind of looking at is how can the community help children keep children safe? So maybe children don't really have a full understanding of, uh, you know, the the, the implications um, uh, that might be implied by posting uh, photos of themselves online. Um, could it help others, including the bad guys, identify children? Very possibly so. And so I think this report is kind of looking at solutions for how we as a, you know, the foundation and a movement can better inform children to help them empower themselves to stay safe. Uh, but you're right. You know, these, these sort of legal questions are really important. Uh, hi, um, my name is Peter. I'm a member of the, of the Polish community, community. And I have uh, some follow-up to the to the former question because it's not only uh, pictures on uh, Wikimedia Commons; it's actually editing Wikipedia. Uh, you do this with the um, w with a certain license, and for example, in Poland there is a law uh, uh, that uh, you you have to be competent to to uh, edit under under the certain lenses it's uh, it's i believe 13 years old you have to be at least to do, to do this so it's not only um not only uh, uploading the the media on on commons but it's also actually uh, editing wikipedia that, that that's the that's the issue as well thank you yeah yeah th that that is an important issue and it shows um it really demonstrates sort of the complexities of how national law interacts with how the Wikimedia model works. Right now, we have no way of knowing which editors are over 13 or under 13 years of age. We have no way of knowing which editors are adults legally or not adults legally, so over the age of 18 in, in many contexts, uh, because we don't collect um, data um, on users like that. So in order for us to do that, we would have to start collecting more amounts of data on all of our users worldwide, uh, which would have significant privacy impacts on everybody and could deter people from exercising their freedom of expression on Wikimedia projects. So all of this to say, these are really complex questions that you know the foundation and the communities need to talk about together because ultimately finding a path forward, that's not for the foundation to um, dictate from above how things are going to be, but rather complex issues that the, uh, that our volunteer communities, uh, you know, need to work out among themselves and figure out a path forward with the support of the foundation, you know, w w when needed, you know, looking at providing legal advice and things like that. So, you know, these are two really great questions that really underscore the complexity of protecting children online. Yeah. Um, um, thank you for those questions. I have a question, though. Uh, yeah, my name is Gabriel yes. from from Switzerland. Uh, so that means that the foundation is uh, you have like an age limit of thirteen for Wikipedia, and we're not talking about what we do to protect children like eleven, twelve year old editors or so on on Wikipedia. Is that correct? Um, I'm not aware of any age limit um, on on Wikipedia. You know, from the foundation's perspective. Um, again, because we don't have we don't collect data on users we have no way of knowing the age on anybody that uses um you know our sites to either just read content or you know receive content or to actively contribute or edit content we don't know um finding out that sort of information would mean a wholesale change of how the wikimedia model works we'd have to collect more data on everybody that uses um our projects and, and that's not a decision that that you know, one can take lightly. <clears throat> so, I, you know, I, I really think that this work is more about building awareness among Wikimedians, building awareness among uh, parents and children and the, the broader public, and doing what we can do, uh, you know, within sort of the, the current scope of the Wikimedia model to keep children safe. And a lot of this has to do, I think, with, with sort of awareness 
um, letting, you know, informing children about the risks and how they can protect themselves and coming up with structures within the foundation to help keep, or, you know, within our projects and the movement and the foundation to, to keep children safe. Um, so again, incredibly complex topic that, you know, can't be solved in one day uh, and, and will likely take many, many years to, to sort of address comprehensively. If, um, hey, Ricky. Yes. Did did you have something else you wanted to say? Or okay, um, is it okay if I clarify something just real quick? Please, if if you don't mind, just just in response. I'm I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Gabriel? Uh, yeah, Gabriel. Um, I'm I'm Rebecca McKenna, and I I work with Ricky. I I lead the global advocacy team. Um, as Ricky said, we do not collect information about the age of editors or of users. Some editors choose to identify various traits of themselves. Many editors do not choose to share various traits of ours, of themselves. Uh, so, for example, we don't even know how many users we have. We don't have, even know how many people visit the projects as, as audiences. When we had to provide data to the European Commission about how many users in Europe, um, you know, access the projects, we couldn't even give a solid number of how many people. We only know how many unique devices connect to the projects, let alone the age of the people who are using those unique devices. And then we use a a formula to average out, you know, approximately X number of people in Europe are, are connecting to the projects. Um, now, in the the U United Kingdom, there is actually a law that uh, now says that uh, internet platforms should verify the ages of users. Now, the regulator has yet to specify the scope of that law, so we don't know if the regulator is going to decide that Wikipedia is in or out of scope of that requirement. We are arguing we should be out of scope of that requirement um, because if we are forced to collect information about the personal traits, if you, know, if you have to find out the age of your users, you there's a lot of other data you have to collect about an individual even to know that they're an individual. Um, and uh, we don't, we have pledged to our community we will not collect that kind of personally identifying information, which then exposes our communities not only to, uh, you know, government demands, right, um, uh, and, and government surveillance, uh, but also uh, a, a range of crimes that people are not, uh, uh, and threats that people are shielded from when we do not have their data. So it is our position that we will not um, we will not age verify the projects. Um, that that is inconsistent with the purpose and values of the projects. That that being said, the reason why we commissioned this this child rights impact assessment is that we recognize, of course, we know that there are some children on the projects. We don't know how many. And we recognize that we have responsibilities towards children, even if we don't know exactly who they are, which, which, is, which is why Ricky has, has led this exercise and is, is leading the effort to have dialogue with the volunteer communities so that within the context of our commitments and values around privacy and freedom of expression, we can do everything reasonable to, to keep young people safe. So I, I, I hope that clarifies. Just for clarity of, of what your second half of the Thank question. Me. Thanks. Just for the second half of your conversation, and I have no official thing, so, but like, I think, yes, there are laws, both in the U.S. and different things for like 13 and up, where there are barriers placed at different levels, but we should 100% be thinking about this at all levels of how to deal with 16-year-olds and 13-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 7-year-olds who have found a phone somehow. Um, I just want to make sure that, yeah, that part, I think you're right, we do have to, to talk about all of those, because it's different pieces. Yeah. Sorry, Ricky. Nope. 
this, these are all great conversations to have, and I wish I could be in the room having them with you all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move this on to the next session or the next section of, of this presentation, which is to review and prioritize recommendations. Um, so our child rights impact assessment provided the foundation with, uh, you know, a couple dozen recommendations uh, for our movements uh, and our organization to consider implementing to, to better protect children. Um, these nine uh, represent a subselection of those recommendations uh, that I uh, took out and chose because I think that they are sort of the the recommendations that require the most uh, discussion uh, with the volunteer community and with affiliates to evaluate how feasible they are for our movement and how impactful they may be. Uh, when we talk about all the recommendations that we received in this child rights impact assessment, we want to be very clear. They're just recommendations. Um, they may not all be feasible for us as a movement, and we need to hear from you all to understand which ones are most feasible for us. Um, so just because you see something on the screen or in that report does not mean it's something that we are um, aggressively going to do. Um, much of this requires consultation with the people in this room and beyond the walls um, of your room um, to, to evaluate. So our exercise today, this is where it gets a little bit more interactive. Um, I need your help in, in, in understanding how feasible these nine recommendations might be. Um, you know, by feasible, I mean, like, how appropriate are they for our movements? Um, you know, are they likely to be something that we could actually accomplish? Um, is there interest or appetite within the volunteer community to actually move these forward? And also, how impactful will they be? You know, will this be something that has a meaningful um you know, a chance of, of keeping children safe on Wiki or giving them a greater voice in our movement. Um, and I can't do this alone. The foundation can't do this alone. So this is really the, 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 the meats of this conversation today and um, what I would like to talk to you about. Uh, so um, I'm not going to read all of these um, to you. Um, I will save you that boredom. Um, but what I'm going to do, if you give me just a moment, I'm going to switch screens and uh, launch us into um, the uh, interactive portion. So bear with me one second. Oh, wait, here, we can start here. So the goal for this exercise is to prioritize recommendations collectively as a group. And what I need to know from you are which recommendations are the most feasible for our movements and which would be the most impactful to keep children safe. So what I ask of you is using this QR code, if you are in the room and you would like to do this on your, your mobile device, um, you know, go to this uh, Mentee um, poll. So you can use the QR code or you can go to mentee.com and use the code um, that you see on your screen. So 2618-8194. And what you will see is for each one of these recommendations, you will have a sort of sliding scale from zero to 10 to rate the feasibility and impactfulness of each recommendation from your own point of view, uh, with uh, you know one being the least uh, feasible and least impactful to 10 being the most. Um, we will see, um, while you are doing this, I will switch screens and uh, we will see sort of in live time, you know, in, in, yeah, in live time, real time, um, what the consensus of the group is um, using an Eisenhower matrix, which will help us to prioritize which recommendations we should probably move forward with. So again, uh, please go to menti.com using the code on your screen or using this QR code if you have your mobile device with you. And um, I'll give you about five to 10 minutes to, to review all of these quietly among yourselves. And uh, we'll reconvene as a group uh, to, to look at the, uh, the results.
that is a platform that is developed on the basis of Moodle, basically, um, where all kind of learning courses that are useful for Wikipedians are hosted in several languages. Um, at the moment, it's already some human rights stuff on there, but there could be a lot more. So it, the content can be developed either by volunteers or by Wikimedia Foundation staff. And everyone basically can bring content trainings, online trainings to that platform. Does that help? That was just describing what WikiLearn is for Ricky's benefit. I believe two six one eight eight one nine four, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I, I hear asking for the code um, uh, for this page. Um, it is two six one eight eight one nine four. Um, let's see, we've, we've got 22 people in here that are contributing, which is fantastic. And I really appreciate everybody, um, going through this. Um, some of you may still be going through, um, each of the recommendations and evaluating them using this polling method, <clears throat> but I'm going to go ahead and kind of move us along to discuss the results and then move us into the next section, um, which I hope you'll find, um, informative, um, this, so many of you have come across an Eisenhower matrix before, I'm sure, uh, but it is a tool that I use to love to evaluate and prioritize options. So right now we have two axes. Um, on the, the vertical side, we have the potential impact. And on the bottom horizontal side, we have the feasibility. So how suitable is something and easy to accomplish for our movement? So this gives us four quadrants. Um, the top right quadrant where many of these recommendations have landed is the high potential impact and the high feasibility. So these are the things that would be great for us to do because they, they're very suitable for our movement and they have a high potential impact for keeping children safe on Wiki. Um, below that, we have things that are very uh, feasible for our movements but are less impactful. Um, and then if we move to the bottom left-hand corner, uh, we have things that are neither feasible, neither impactful. So, you know, perhaps they're not the right um, recommendations for us to focus on. 
And then in the upper left-hand side, we have things that are not very feasible, um, but potentially very impactful. So these are the things that would sort of be classified as like moonshots, like, hey, let's give it a try. It may or may not work, but it could really be impactful to help keep children safe. But um, 23 of you have voted and evaluated all of these different recommendations. And I'm very surprised to see that most of them have landed in this um, upper right-hand quadrant of things that are very feasible um, and very potentially impactful, um, which is great to know that you the, the consensus is in the group is that these recommendations are things that could be um, achieved or accomplished or worked on by, uh, by our movement and have the potential to, to really keep children safe on with you. Uh, we have recommendations one and two uh, that are sort of borderline, um, you know, on, on potential impact um, and, and feasibility as well. So I would like to use this to really um, focus the next area of, um, of conversation, which is to break up into small groups in the room um, to come up with uh, community-led plans of action to, to address some of these recommendations. I would recommend that, uh, let's see, I think there are probably, we could do two large groups or we could do three smaller groups in the room. Um, I'll leave it to my colleague Ziski to, to kind of be the ringleader for this uh, in-person exercise. Uh, but I would recommend that the groups focus on recommendations four, nine, and six, um, let me write that down so I can uh, switch. Well, I don't need to write that down um, to go through the next exercise. So forgive me one more time and um, I will um, uh, and I will switch screens. Ricky, while you're doing that, I think maybe yes. we'll do three groups so we can have some really good discussions and we can just split them up based on where people are sitting in the room. So we'll do sort Great. of from Rebecca here, the left as one group, then we'll have a group of about five from the middle and then everybody who's on the side. And we'll have, I'll take, uh, Rebecca, you can take this group on the left, I'll take the group in the middle and Joe, you can help with the group that's gonna be on the side. And Ricky, remind me, what are the numbers again? Uh, recommendations four, nine, and six. So we'll do four, nine, six. <laughs> I decide all. <laughs> Ricky, is there going to be anybody online with you? Um, no, um, I believe it's just me. How much time would you like us to have for this? Let's do um, let's do 20, 20 minutes, and we can extend if needed. I think we can probably do less, to be honest, but let's start with that. Um, is there any way for okay. us to involve you? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know technically. Do I don't, that. yeah, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we'll just what, 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 Siski, why don't you bring the microphone into whatever group you were in and I will just listen in. Yes, that's a good idea. Mm. Okay. No, actually, yeah, I don't think we can do that. Okay, well, then I'll just sit tight. <laughs> All right, see you in a bit. All right. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you have more 
Same goes on there. Thank you. 
we'll give it another two minutes before we uh, get back to the group to, to share what uh, our discussions were. All right, everyone. I'm sorry to interrupt what I'm sure are very productive and fruitful conversations, but uh, this session, uh, we only got about 15 minutes left, and I want to make sure that we have enough time for each group to share with one another 
um, you know, what their discussions were and what their plans of action are. Um, so what we can do is let's give each group uh, four minutes to share with the rest of us what their discussion was, what their desired outcome is, who in the movement is ideally suited to lead on this, et cetera, et cetera. So, Ziski, if I could ask you to sort of pass the microphone around to one member from each group, uh, we'll go ahead and start the share out. Can I give this microphone to somebody in the group? Oh, he's got one. Demi or Hello. Do, uh, Should we just take it now that I have a mic? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Hi, Ricky. Um, hi, everybody in the room. We had prompt number four, which was to... It was something about the incident reporting system. I've looked it up multiple times now. Let me quickly grab it. Uh, or you can grab it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, develop a rapid escalation process for cases or incidents involving children within the incident reporting system. Um, so we spent quite a lot of time just talking more or less about what the incident reporting system is and will be because it is currently in development by the trust and safety product team. Um, spoke a little bit what, about like what kind of cases should be escalated through it, the sort of potential for abuse of those processes, um, how you can sort of tell an incident is affecting a child in some way is, is, is going to be quite difficult. Um, and um, speaking about like different kind of abuse that could be reported through there, um, what that might sort of look like where that abuse should be routed like a lot of these questions trust and safety product are already thinking about uh, but we did speak a bit about how trust and safety already responds to these kind of um, these kinds of issues we spoke a bit about uh, our emergency protocol and the sort of turnaround time we have on that our service level agreement uh, time is is three hours for those cases but most of them we deal with in a few minutes uh, because we're paged 24 7 about them uh, and we were thinking about like that might not necessarily be the timeline you'd want to use for um, these kinds of cases, but I think it depends quite a lot on how um, what what's sort of involved with those cases and whether or not they need to be seen by the foundation. And um, we did briefly speak about mental health resources for administrators as well, um, and uh, especially when we're talking about like the really harrowing stuff that can potentially involve children. Uh, on the projects and uh, how we can sort of support the local um, communities with training or resources to sort of decompress after they've handled cases that involve children because it can be quite difficult. Uh, does that cover everything? Anything I missed? Oh, we did talk about the language issue too. So yeah, the incident reporting system, as far as I understand it, I'm not the most uh, equipped to talk about it. Um, you need a technical person probably, but my understanding is it would go to a local community first, uh, which would help with language and culture issues. Sorry, help with language and culture issues. Um, so uh, when people are reviewing things like discussions and uh, sort of conduct, then they have that local context as well. Uh, whereas if you're sending everything to a centralized international body, it could be a lot more difficult, especially if there's nobody on that team who's from those cultures or speak those languages. Um, yeah, I think I'm getting nods from the rest of our sort of team, so I think that more or less is covers it. So perhaps I'll present what we talked about. So our um, topic was to talk about trainings for volunteers on the issue of child safety. And we talked about that there are so many different kinds of trainings that are actually needed because it is so different um, if you want to train someone about how to write articles about children, what content to include, what not to, or people who upload pictures who do, for example, uh, cover a sports event with children. Um, that is a totally different topic as those people who have offline events and who have to make sure that the children in the room are actually safe or who are conducting offline events and perhaps they are offering babysitting services during the event. That is again another issue because those children will be so much smaller than children taking part in events. And so um, we said we need to look also at other institutions that already know what kind of trainings there are 
um, that have experience what is needed to keep children safe on those different areas. And probably the foundation should be leading on it, but that the affiliates and hopefully also the hubs um, would be very important partners to bring all these things to the local context. Because, for example, in Germany, it's easy to find someone that I can hire that comes from an agency um, for babysitting that is vetted, while in another context, vetting would be done by the people who hire the babysitter. And vetting is a skill on its own that people need to be, uh, to be um, yeah, trained on. And so we also said we have different groups and we probably need first to train those who have the most impact and the most contact with children. At the one hand, that would be the functionaries online. On the other hand, it would be organizers, of course, of events that include children. Um, yeah, so there would also be, we would, we would need to do more prioritizing on who needs to be trained. Um, did I forget anything? Thanks. So over to you, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you. I, we quickly realized that the feasibility score on the Eisenhower matrix might have been a little higher than than in reality as we started digging into the the challenges of even figuring out where to start. Um, but but to speak to the ideas that that came up and and. I'll be able to explain kind of how we arrived at those ideas and get at the challenges that way, if that's okay. Um, one, one thing that was clear is that starting from the perspective and in partnership with teachers and parents is very important because uh, also children aren't going to read a guide. It's the teachers and parents who, who are actually going to need to work with the kids on uh, you know, what to do um, uh, and, and kind of take the guidance on. And so for the kids themselves, it's more you, you need videos and TikToks, um, you know, kind of short videos and, and TikToks and, and interactive things that are not, you know, a, a written guide. Um, and, of course, there's the language challenge as well. Um, another point that was made, um, uh, you know, is that uh, it's, there are existing materials written by volunteers kind of around perhaps Meta or in other places um, on Wiki um, offering advice to younger editors, but they're very hard to find and it's kind of piecemeal around. So starting by just assembling what we have, but we also learn just from going around that the affiliates have lots of different experiences and learnings in working with children that probably hasn't been compiled anywhere. Um, so just sort of a bit of a mapping and, and compilation of both people's activities and experience and also learnings um, would would be important, perhaps not for the guide itself, but just just to to help with all of this work um, that that the the communities and, and foundation are are trying to do. Um, and another point was just we need a guide for everyone on nonviolent communication and civil behavior in general because children would be much safer and or feel safer if everybody um, was less aggressive and behaved more civilly um, and and that training about how to behave and nonviolent communication and so on broadly um, would be very useful so those are kind of the the initial things but so I guess in conclusion it's less about one guide. <laughs> And and more about a suite of different things that uh, would need to be produced and um, kind of projects that would need to be carried out. <clears throat> Hope that's helpful. Anything huge that I omitted? No. 
Excellent. Well, thank you all for sharing. Um, these were all really great discussions that you all had, and, and I think it highlights kind of how much work there is to do and um, how challenging uh, you know, this issue can be and these solutions can be. Um, it takes a lot of work, a lot of resources, um, and a lot of time. Um, before I close us out, uh, I would like to open it up to you all in the room if you all have any reflections on some of the action plans that other groups had or if you would like to share some of your takeaways from this discussion, uh, I, I'll, I'll just open the floor up very quickly for you all. Um, I think just a, a general thought from looking, like I, I think it's, there's a lot of good ideas and there's a lot of trying to, to push. And as I said, sort of near the end of my group, that I, I think that there's an important question to have of sort of how much we want to legalize and talk about this and that there is dragons and conversations but also by doing that it allows us to regulate and advise and guide and do more but but also that we've been doing a lot of this for a long time there's been teachers editing wikipedia with their students since basically the beginning of wikipedia but certainly for the past 15 to 20 years um but and also a lot of the things we're trying to protect kids of about from are from the kids like when i was starting the, the core of what our culture is was 15 to 25 year olds <laughs> deciding to set up how to set up Wikipedia. Um, and so we're, we're, we're trying to sort of like help adjust the culture, but remember that they are part of the culture and that we're sort of moving, moving forward together. When, when I listened to you, Rebecca, um, I really also um, remembered part of what we said in the end of um, – it needs so many different things. And I think, Ricky, you also said it needs a lot of resources and it needs time. And that was something that our group also stressed that I didn't bring up enough before, that resources are super, super important. And that one one show who is also doing other work, <laughs> one show is always wonderful. Everyone should have one show, but one show is not enough. <laughs> and so um, I think the foundation, if it wants to do something, really needs to invest. And I think also the, the complexity of how different the situation is in African countries, in South Asian countries, in North America, in Latin America, in Europe, even within Europe. Um, Claudia brought that up, that the difference between the regulations in Germany and in Austria already are <sighs> making it difficult to do something for the German language Wikipedia. Um, and so, yeah, it's a huge thing, but I think we've been doing it for a long time and we shouldn't stop doing it and we should push for more resources to do this well. Just to yes, more, jo to more Joes would be a great resource if we could manage that. And then just saying, like, if you come from a federal country, then it gets even more because, like, uh, uh, child protection in Austria is federalized. So we have nine different federal states that have and, their and own the US. <laughs> regulations. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else want the mic? Oh. I'll just say thank you to Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this concludes our, our workshop today. I, I want to thank you all for joining. I, I know it's you know later on day four after lunch. You're, you're probably ready for a nap or maybe a drink at this point. Uh, but thank you for joining us to talk about this this really important topic and for sharing with us your your ideas about how the foundation and the community can both work to to protect children on Wiki. Um, I really want to emphasize that protecting children on Wiki is all of our responsibilities. Um, you know, whether we are um, volunteers, we represent affiliates, or we work at the foundation. And I really encourage all of you to take on any efforts that, you know, we discussed today or that came to mind or somebody else thought about um, to, to keep children safe on our projects um, and share that with others, invite others. Um, I think our community is, is a great way where we can, um, you know, try out different approaches and pilot them and find out what works and what doesn't work, and then scale up the solutions that, that prove to be really promising. And I really want you all to know that anyone can be a leader in this area. Um, you don't need a title. 
Um, you know, you don't need a role in an organization. Any volunteer can lead in our community, which I think is one of the magic things that makes it great. So please stay in touch. We would love to, to continue to work with you in this area. Um, please feel free to, to email globaladvocacy at wikimedia.org to join our mailing list. And um, I'll, I'll also share any follow-up resources that, that come from this group, um, including sort of a summary of all of uh, your conversation so you all can, can have that with you after Wikimedia. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your time in, in Poland. And uh, please, um, somebody eat lots of pierogies for me. Oh, yeah, we've been doing it. Good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ricky. Thanks, Ricky. And th thanks to the production team. Everything went smoothly. Woo!